what it ought to be. And, and I would suggest that even in our Psalms, we will find that we don't want it to be the way that the Bible talks about it being. We want it to be the way we want it to be so that we can enjoy or we can, we can understand. And part of what Isaiah is doing is trying to show the people that God's judgment is coming. Remember this morning I talked about the fact that Jesus stopped short of that whole quote. We're going to talk about that because in that idea in, in Isaiah, uh, these first three verses, we'll find him speaking about the year of Jubilee. Um, a few weeks back, uh, a few months ago, Manny had mentioned it in one of his uh, uh, one of our services where we had uh, uh, the bilingual service. But when you look at Isaiah 61 and you look down at verse 2, it says, To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of thinking, so that they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. In this passage, he's talked about all he's going to do preceding that, talking about what we talked about this morning, healing the, the brokenhearted and bringing uh, liberty to the uh, captive and freedom to the prisoner. And, and now he talks about something that the Jew would completely understand, and I'm going to explain it to you this way. When you turn 50 years old, wouldn't it be cool if all of your creditors forgave all that you owe? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a year to celebrate, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, you just uh, experienced that moment of, yeah, that'd be great. You experienced what they experienced every 50 years. Because every seven years, they would celebrate um, uh, the, the year of Jubilee. But what they would do is, every seven years, they would let the land lay fallow. In other words, they wouldn't plant anything on it. They would eat off of what just came up. They let their animals eat freely. They allowed the ground to rest. And during this period of time, in fact, it's interesting, the background passage, if you wanted to look at it, look with me over Leviticus chapter 25, verse 7, because it kind of explains the whole thing. And when Isaiah is referring to uh, this year um, or, or this favorable year of the Lord, that's what he's speaking of. It says in Leviticus chapter 25, everybody there? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. It's right there next to the back. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, everybody there? Let's take a look at it. Verse 8 is where we'll start this. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for, uh, for yourselves. Seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seventh Sabbath of the years, namely 49 years. You shall then sound a ram's horn abroad, and on the tenth day of the seventh month, and on the day of atonement, you shall sound a horn all through the land. You shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release through the, uh, through the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. You shall have the 50th year as a jubilee. You shall not sow nor reap its aftergrowth, nor gather it from its untrimmed vines. He, he's telling them, he says, that the 50th year is a year that everything goes back. And if you keep reading that, read the, the, the stuff in the beginning of the passage. In fact, 2 through 7 tells us every seven years the Jews were to observe a sabbatical year and allow the land to rest. Okay? After, in verses 8 through 22, after the seven year sabbaticals, or after seven sabbaticals, or 49 years, they were to celebrate the 50th year as the year of ju Jubilee. During this year, all debt was canceled. Yay. All land was returned to its original owners. The slaves were freed, and everybody was given a fresh, new beginning. You know, I just turned 50 a couple, two, three years ago, and they didn't do that for me. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great? This was the Lord's way of balancing the economy and keeping the rich from exploiting the poor. You see, if you leave it unchecked, all they'll do is just want to get more and more and more and more and more. And they will continue to do that until bondage comes and slavery comes into that, where all you're working for is to pay someone else. Isn't that slavery? Well, we've chosen to do that. So in the process, if we look at it now, kind of the imagery of this, 
that year of Jubilee that they celebrated where all that was going on, and went, uh, Yahoo, and look at what's happening. The same thing takes place, though, when you look at Christ, and that's why he's compared to the year of Jubilee. Uh, a lot of excitement, a lot of thrill, a lot of, uh, of uh, relief, a release, all of those kind of things, because his coming is like the year of Jubilee. And they would understand that. We wouldn't understand because we've never gone through a jubilee. Several years ago, we watched a, a movie on harbingers, which are basically just messages that uh, are in Scripture, and you try and put them together and everything. And, and the man in the movie was trying to get us to believe that we were a nation of God. And, and I know that a lot of you say, well, we have it in our pledges. And everything. We're not a nation of God. Uh, and if you doubt that, believe it or not, the big... is in Korea, in South Korea, and guess what? The biggest training center for Islam is in the United States. Are we really? Are we really a Christian nation? Um, I can give you other things like that that would help you go, oh wow, I didn't know that. But the reality of it is no, we're not. And in this, he was trying to liken us unto Israel. And he said, just like in the year of Jubilee, and the reason judgment is coming is because uh, we're not uh, uh, living with that year of Jubilee. And uh, as I told the folks when they watched the movie, I said, we haven't been doing that since the beginning. Why would we need to start it in 2001 when a building gets hit by a couple of, like two buildings get hit with aircraft? Why would we start trying to imply that we've done this all the time? Well, we've never done it. And my point in telling you that is you can't understand the fullness of what was being said by Isaiah or what was being said by Jesus when he said these words because they would have understood it to be the greatest thing that could ever happen, the year of Jubilee. Since we don't understand the fullness of that, it's hard for us to grasp it. But we have, when we trust Jesus Christ as Savior, are living in a spiritual year of Jubilee. You realize that? When we accepted Christ, think about the things that you were freed from. When you think about it, you've been set free from bondage. Your spiritual debt to the Lord has been paid. What was your debt? A debt you couldn't pay, but you owed it. And what was that debt? That debt was in sin, and there was no way that you could pay it. And because you couldn't pay it, he paid it for us. Isn't that the same kind of principles that we find in the year of Jub Jubilee? The things that we can't redeem back to ourselves were given to us. The things that we can't demand or earn were given to us at a place called Calvary and from a tomb where he rose. You've been set free from bondage. You are living in the acceptable year of the Lord. What this means to us today, in fact, it goes on that passage and talks of, um, instead of ashes of mourning, now we have the opportunity of these things. Giving them a garland instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. All of these things are given to us and I'd like to just explain a little bit about each one of those. In the first one where it talks about our ashes of mourning or garland, in other words it's it's something, when you put up garland, you put it up at a funeral? Put it up at a celebration. We put it up a lot of times at Christmas time, if you use garland. It was something used to decorate and proclaim something great. Well, what is it that's great about all of this? Our ashes, when we die, that's what we become in this body, dirt. Dirt. But spiritually, what do we become? If we're lost apart from Christ, we spend eternity separated from our Creator. If we're in Christ Jesus, we spend eternity with our Creator. So the mourning that's there, the sadness that's there, is no longer there because no longer are we bound by the things of death. Now, some people that, that are maybe new to all this, you might be thinking, oh my goodness, he's going to ask us to go out and drink poison in a few minutes so that we can all experience this. The answer to that is absolutely not. I have no need to. I believe that God is on his throne, and when it's our time, when he needs to call us home, he will call us home. 
And if he comes before he calls us, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. We have a unique position as believers. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, Paul writes, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together in him. It's interesting because Paul understood it. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Why? Because he afforded that to us. If you could be uh, accepted into a royal family with all of the, all of the uh, perks and the benefits and all those kind of things, wouldn't that be a cool thing? To live in a castle? And that's one thing I've always wanted to do is go visit some of the old castles and see how some of these people lived in these castles that are, that are all the way back in the, the 11th, 10th, 11th century. Wouldn't that be just cool to see that? But you see, we're adopted into the family of God through Jesus Christ because we chose to accept the invitation. No longer do we have to mourn in the ashes. No longer do we have to worry about death. No longer do we have to worry about the things that scare us so much in this world. He said, I've come so that you could overcome. In the process of this, he also, in Revelation 1.6 and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I, I thought it was interesting because in the King James, which I just read, it, it talks about where we become kings. But how many kings are there? One. In fact, if you look at that word, you will find that king, basilus, is the word for king. And the word that's used there in Revelation in the King James Version uh, is Basilus, but that's not what it says. The NASB says it this way. It says, and he has made us to be a kingdom. And that word is Basileia. Two different words. But you know, you got some people running around and say, we're going to be kings. We're just like God. We'll be God. We'll be kings and all that other stuff. The reality of it is, when I look through scripture and everything like that, and when you look through these scriptures, and you understand of the Greek what it says, it says that we'll be in a kingdom, and in that kingdom, notice what our position will be. Priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, it does the same thing. King James Version says, And has made us unto God, our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And the NASB, it says, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Once again, the word uh, is not uh, basilus, it's basileia. And because of that, it tells us that it's a kingdom. It's, it's not just you being a king or me being a king. Some people say, well, what about Paul? He was talking about a crown. Yes, he was over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, but he's talking about a crown of righteousness. That Christ will give him, not a Christ of, uh, not a crown of kingship. And you may be saying, well, wait a minute, that's just blowing my mind away. I just ask you because there's not time for us to do it tonight. I would just ask you to consider uh, that God didn't say, okay, you're going to be kings. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Don't worry about it. It's just a brown now. I've got this memorized, so we're good with it. All right. So, please, Lord, don't tempt me. Don't test me. He doesn't tempt me. So, in the process of this, we see this in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. It tells us our position very clearly. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, I think we, we put some things on those words. But the reality of it is, He's the king, and there is only one king. Everything in heaven worships the king. Therefore, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even take for a moment and say, I'm going to be a king sitting right there next to him. I don't think I would ever take that position because I know him to be king. And I don't see anywhere in Scripture where it's, it's, he's offering that we can be just like him or be a god like him, as some of the world tries to teach us today. So as we look at this, we are made priests. We are in the royal family. We are part of the kingdom of God. That turns our, our mourning and our ashes and the things that would say we are no more. It would turn and say, wait a minute, we are something. 
we're precious to God and we are a part of his kingdom as priests and as joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I hope that you could see that that's part of the encouragement that we find in that passage. We also see the imagery of oil, the oil of gladness. In this particular passage, as you, as you look at those, those uh, latter, in verse 3, it says, instead of ashes, the oil of gladness, instead of mourning, the mantle of praise, instead of a uh, spirit of fainting. As we consider that oil of gladness, I don't know if you've ever heard of the uh, Belfast Revival. Uh, they did a musical presentation of that back in the early 2000s, late 1999. It's called Revival in Belfast. And what it was was a musical tribute to God. And one of the songs in it is a song that you may have heard called Garments of Praise. It says, uh, put on the garments of praise with a spirit of heaviness. Let the oil of gladness flow down from your throne. Put on the garments of praise, and it continues on. But it's based on, in no small part, on this passage right here. Because where does the oil of gladness come from? From God's throne. It's something that he provides. Notice it doesn't say, I will give you from some other source the oil of gladness. The oil of gladness will come from me. Now, to you and me, what does oil mean to us today? We cook with it. We fry things that are bad for us in it. Amen. Or they're actually good. And when we fry it, it makes it bad. Something like that. But the reality of it is, the oil in their day was something that uh, for, was for use for kings, for anointing. It was also used for uh, uh, heating as, as well as lighting and everything else. The oil that was there was very beneficial. It's kind of like uh, us today. If, if they were to close all the gas stations in San Antonio today and leave them closed for about a week, would you not appreciate it when they open back up? The following week, you betcha, the oil of gladness, uh, the oil also lubricated things. It allowed things to function easier, the oil of gladness. Now, I, I can't help but think of, of it bringing joy that they would have these kind of things. The widow of Zarephath said, all I've got is a little oil and a little meal. They used it for cooking as we do today. So it was used very extensively. In fact, all she had was a little bit. And notice she didn't save anything else. All she had was just enough to make enough cake for her son and herself. And she said to Elijah, she said, as soon as we eat this, we're going to eat it and go and die. Because there's no more. And Elijah said what? He said, tell you what, you go do that. But before you eat of it, you bring it to me and let me have some of it. And so she did what he said. And then he came and stayed with her. And for the whole time he was there, the meal never ran out and the oil never ran out. You see, they would understand it in their time. Uh, that gasoline illustration that I used, you're so dependent upon it, at least in transportation, but they were dependent upon it for life in general. So we see the imagery of the oil. And, and in my mind, flowing down from the throne of God, not something they had to produce or manufacture or go get. God was providing it. You know, as I look at my life and I see all of the things that have gone on in my life and I see in other people's life, God providing the things that they need in their life. You may be saying, oh, I just don't, I don't see that right now in my life. You know, the sad part about it is we never go back and look. Because if we look, go back and look and we say, God had me here at this time for this purpose. God had me here at this time for that purpose. God had me here at this time for that purpose. And if we would go back and look at the purpose of where we've been throughout our whole life and watch where God has placed us, you're not here by accident. And you're not here because I'm the greatest preacher in the world, because I'm not. <coughs> the reality of it is you're here because God's placed you here in this time. And the sad part about it is so often when we're placed in a certain place at a certain time, we're so busy thinking about all the other things that are going wrong that we don't thank Him for where we are. We're not looking for what He's doing. We feel almost stuck. I know that a lot of you probably through your life said, I want a better job. I want a better job. I want a better job. You know, you know what the Bible teaches about that? Be a good employee. Amen. Be a good employee. Amen. It doesn't say anything about look for a better job. It says be a better employee. Be a good one. Be the best one that your, that your boss, your master, your employer would say, yay, this is the best person working for me. Doesn't talk about what's better for you. When God's ready to put you in something better, do you not believe that God's big enough to put you in something better? And it's usually not because you went looking, it's because somebody came looking for you because God had that on his radar. Well, 
we see that these things come down from the throne of God. These things are things that if we see them in the time in which we live, you know, I could gripe and moan and talk about back in the 50s and 60s and how it must have been better to live back then. You know what? When you talk to people who came out of the 50s and 60s, if they're not trying to recapture their glory and everything like that, you'll find them saying, you know, it was a pretty rough time then too. There were things that today you would, you would say if you live back in the 60s, no cell phones. I'm just saying. Uh, I mean, it's very limited television. I guarantee you there wouldn't be any cable. No dish. Yeah. Wow. Most of you probably uh, would have an old beat-up car if you had a car at all. Wow. No internet. Oh, well, that goes with the cell phone, doesn't it? Internet stuff. Wow. You think back on that and you go, wow, it had been great to go back to the, the, the 30s. Uh, or the 40s. Hey, they had a world war back then. I don't know if that would have been such a good time to live in. Yeah. Uh, I guess it would be if you made it through it, but look at all the people who didn't. Wow. We need to really take a look at the fact where we are. God has us here in this place for this time. Um, Esther said it this way, uh, or uh, uh, Mordecai said this to Esther. He said, for such a time as this, how do you know that for such a time as this you haven't been called to this place for this purpose? Well, so often when we're looking at everything around us, we're not looking at what God's doing in the midst of us and what He's doing in our life. He goes on and it speaks about a garment uh, in that passage. If you look, it says in the, the latter part of it, it says uh, uh, instead of a mantle of praise, instead of a spirit of fainting. A mantle of praise, in other words, he's clothed us. He's, uh, another word for mantle would be garment, a uh, covering. He's covered us. With what? With himself. He's covered us. Isn't that cool to just think about it? God has got our back. And why wouldn't we want to put on and allow the, the, the garments of praise to be on us? To speak of the greatness of God. It's not because we deserve that mantle or that garment on us. It's not because we've earned it. It's because He chose to put it on us because we chose to fall in love with Him because He loved us first. And so we can put that garment of praise on and it now becomes a symbol to all who see and it also becomes something that would be, uh, be a declaration on our part to say, that's important <clears throat> because God's placed it there. Well... The final thing that it speaks of in this, in this particular section, it talks about um, them being uh, oaks of righteousness. In fact, Jeremiah refers to them as, as just dying, basically. But Isaiah is saying in his day that they will be oaks of righteousness. In the day that Isaiah is speaking about, they're a waterless garden. But the kingdom, she will be like a watered garden. And it speaks of that in 5811 of Isaiah. And a tree, an oak of righteousness in 61.3. But all of God's people, in fact, if you look at Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, it talks about the oaks that are planted by the waters. Won't be moved. Now, I have a question for you to just think about. In God's forest, what kind of tree are you? A weeping willow. <laughs> An elm tree that's always sick. Elms are really bad about disease and stuff like that. What kind of a tree are you? You know, in, in Scripture it speaks of an oak because oak is a very, very strong tree. Almost to the point of brittleness. But it's a very strong tree and its roots usually go very deep. And not only deep, but they also finger out to give it a base to be able to stand in the strongest of winds. I've been down, and if you've never seen it, it's quite a sight. Um, down in uh, Fulton, they have uh, what's considered to be one of the oldest oaks in Texas. And the thing is huge. And they, they say that it's somewhere, I think, better than a thousand years old. That's an old oak. And it's right there, not probably uh, 600 yards from the the salt water of, of uh, St. Charles Bay. And when you go and look at it, you go, wow. That thing's got branches that reach out and everything like that. It's just huge. And when I think of that, I think of that as the way we ought to look. 
about the things of God where people would want to come and see what we are and what's caused us to be that way. He says in this, he'll make most of righteousness God planted, God glorifying. I look at that tree, and all I can do is say, God did that. That's awesome. But is that what people say about us in our life? I invite your attention to the final thing that Jesus said, or, or that Isaiah said, and the final thing that Jesus omitted, and that was the passage dealing with the vengeance of the Lord. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on it. Those of you who are Christian here tonight, those of you who may not be, the Bible does tell us that there will be a time when judgment comes. This is what eludes us today. And a lot of people are like, there's no judgment. God is a God of love. And even Jesus stopped short of saying that. But wait a minute. Isaiah said this. If part of his prophecy is wrong, then all of it's wrong. If we only say there's just that much of it, then, then you can say, oh, it's just quoting. But the reality of it is Jesus, Jesus wasn't here to bring judgment with regard to uh, sin. He was there to give us an opportunity to experience the year of Jubilee, to know Him. So He's not here to pass judgment. The Bible tells us that very clearly. He's not here to pass judgment. Now, some people confuse that with should we live in a righteous life. Yes, and some people say when others tell them what they should or shouldn't do, that they're just judging them. That's different than what we're talking about here. This is the judgment for all time. This is the one where the holy judge, the righteous judge, stands and says, judgment is now being pronounced. Now, oftentimes people try and argue over, well, don't judge me, don't judge me. You know what? I can, I can stop. I will tell you anything about the things of God and what you ought to be doing. I can just clam up and not say another word. But I promise you this, if you continue in sinful things and if the world continues the way that it's going, understand God's not just going to turn his head and say, oh, well, you know, I got to thinking about it and I changed my mind. What Isaiah is saying here is there's going to be a day when God says it's done. In fact, over in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, it says, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. And to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing with retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. You may be worried about somebody doing some little lie or some little uh, uh, adultery thing or whatever, and, and, and they get all mad at you because you say something to them about it. The reality of it is there's not going to be a free pass when God comes as judge. It says very clearly in Thessalonians that there won't be a place. In fact, I had somebody challenge me about the angels one time. And in Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter in Jude. But in verses 14 and 15, when it deals with the angels, and it was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam, Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly and all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. i, I got to tell you, it doesn't look like it's going to fare real easy for those when judgment does come. I have never stood and preached a great deal about judgment, judgment, judgment. But I also don't want you to think that, hey, God's just passive and he's not going to worry about it. He says that it's coming. And if we can trust that everything else that he says is true, why would we not trust that that's true as well? So it's not matter, it doesn't matter what you can get away with because I can't argue with you or because you don't argue with me. God says there will be a day when I'm coming, I'll come with my angels, there will be judgment. And we can look through Revelation and see much of that taking place. Well, in dealing with this, in verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians, these will pay the penalty for uh, eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you, uh, for our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you also that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire of goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and 
you and him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. When we see Paul is talking about these very things, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I'm not trying to give you some new thought. I'm telling you that what Isaiah said, Paul was talking about the same thing. Paul was talking about it. It's talked about in Revelation. So there's going to be a time when not only did God fulfill that first part where it brings the day of Jubilee and the opportunity for everybody, but also the day of vengeance. And I think because it's mentioned in both places, both the Old and the New, Test Te Old and New Testament, we ought to take it seriously and say, wow, there are a lot of our friends, a lot of the people that we're acquainted with that are going to face this one day. And that only put in us an urgency about sharing with them. Not just leaving it undone, but an urgency that says we should share these things with our friends. Well, I want you to take a look at one more passage, and I promise you that we are done for the evening. Look with me at Isaiah 61. We're going to be looking at verse 10 and 11. I share these with you because this is the cool part about it. It is uh, Isaiah's rejoicing in what God is going to be doing. Isaiah 61, verses 10 and 11. It says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my name, in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with the, with the garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as the garden causes things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. He's rejoicing for Israel. He's rejoicing actually for Judah. He's rejoicing and saying, God's going to do a great thing. Are you paying attention? Notice he goes back and he talks about the things I talked about, the garments of praise, about God being sufficient, about God doing all of these things. This is his praise back to God. It's not him telling what God is going to do. Now he's saying, let me praise you for what I understand you're going to do. And that was his understanding of it. He said, I'll rejoice in you. He said, my soul exalts my God. You go a little bit further, it goes from the destruction, all that we've seen in Isaiah and about the Assyrian kings and, and about the Babylonians and all those things that we've seen, and it goes at the, at, at the conclusion or toward the conclusion of this book, it goes into, I will praise him even though I know all these things are going to happen, I'll still praise him. I'll exalt my God. I don't know what's ahead for uh, the world or anything like that. If I knew that, I would be God and um, that wouldn't be good. You ought to be fearful for that. Could you imagine me being God? That would be scary. I'm not. But the reality of it is, no matter what happens, I can still praise Him because He is. He is. And that's what we find at the end of this chapter as He exalts God. He says, I understand what's going on. He tells them to be joyful in 60. He says, in 61, this is what he's going to do. And then he rejoices in those last verses in 10 and 11. He rejoices in those because he can be a part of that. You know, that's what I would say to you. We get to be a part of all of this. That's just cool. And that's just awesome. Uh, Isaiah was getting to be a part of that. And although he didn't see the Messiah, he had faith that all that he said would come true, it came true. Jesus spoke of a time that we live in today, an age of grace. Some would call it a dispensation, but the age of grace where God says, I love you. I'm coming for the brokenhearted. I'm coming for the captive. I'm coming for the slave. I'm coming to bring grace and mercy. And he came. Now we're living it. What an awesome place to be. What an awesome place to be. Of all the times in history to be born. To be born, whether it's at the beginning of it or the end of it. To be born in that time. Wow. Would you stand with me? Father, thank you.